After a year and a half of trying, Mel was finally pregnant. When she told me the news, I was elated. I was beyond myself, and I knew instantly what it meant. As much as I loved our current place, our large bay windows and the quick access to work by subway, well, I knew that our apartment downtown would be too small, especially since she was expecting a set of twins. Well, we needed, at the very least, one or two more rooms, and so we started looking for houses in the suburbs. Needless to say, the first three months were unsuccessful. We tried to do it on our own without the help of a realtor, but the market just didn't want us to be happy, I guess. The houses were way beyond our budget, and even if we combined both of our paychecks, with two kids on the way, there was no way we would be able to afford a house without living to paycheck to paycheck. And you don't want to bring kids into the world if you're not ready for them. If we had to stay tight in the apartment until we saved enough, well, we were going to. But this wasn't an ideal situation either. Where would we put the babies? In the living room? In our room with us? No, we definitely needed a new place. But we both wanted the best for our kids. An apartment just wouldn't cut it. I was making a decent wage. Probably could get a loan for about 200000 and Mel could probably get 100000 more. We contacted a realtor and told him the area that we were looking for and our budget. He told us it would be tight, but he would find something. And he did find something. A week later, he was contacting us again with a house he said hadn't been sold in a while. So we would be able to negotiate the price quite a bit. The house had been put on sale about two years ago and still hadn't sold. He told us that someone had died in there because that's the law and he's obligated to tell us. He said that there could be an agreement to a lower price. It was priced at 320000 which was just a little bit above our budget. But our realtor told us not to worry. He would try to get it down to two hundred and forty. The house sounded lovely as he described it. Four big rooms, a living room, basement, fully furnished kitchen, including a dishwasher, a backyard that was a little small, but big enough if we ever decided to get a pool and a patio. He sent the photos, and Mel thought it looked alright. She wasn't too happy about the fact that someone died in there, but the house had everything we wanted. I mean, okay, it would need a good repainting and take out some of the horrid wallpapers, but all in all, it kind of answered all our needs. There was even a school nearby and it was about 20 minutes away from Mel's parents, which definitely played in this house's favor. We fixed the date to visit it, and within 15 minutes of visiting it, both Mel and I were charmed. The residential neighborhood was peaceful and green, as we wanted it to be. We were 20 minutes from her parents. I was 5 minutes away from the highway that would lead me to work, and I was also in the other direction than the traffic, so I could be at work and tops maybe 35 minutes. Really, this house was the dream. What's best is that our realtor told us, the gleam in his eyes, that he managed to lower it to 230000 He said he tried for 220 but the lowest the bank was willing to go was 230 So only did we not have it 90000 under the listed price, but it had everything we hoped for in a house. And, well, our budget wasn't going to be ruined by it. We did the only logical thing we could have done. We bought the house. We got ourselves approved for a loan, and then we bought it. The house would need a bit of love, but I could already see us grow old there. We'd be able to add a patio in the back, and we'd be able to have friends and family over. Possibly a pool, and maybe even a small shed for our outdoor equipment. It was cozy inside. A nice neighborhood around, and, well, what was there not to love? We had to do a lot of work by ourselves to save money, but we managed to do it. And first, we tore off that damn wallpaper on the wall. I tried to tell Mel to sit down because she was pregnant, but trust me, you don't tell a pregnant woman what to do. When we ripped the carpets off of the floor, including the one in the basement, I mean, who even puts carpets on their floor anymore? And in the basement, which is the worst idea ever. Whatever. 
The thing smelled of mold and humidity so bad, I really had to push Mel out. This couldn't be good for the babies, and it took me hours to get the damn thing off the floor, but it was worth it. And right beneath it was a beautiful hardwood floor that just needed sanding and a fresh coating of wax. And that's when I found it. It was a trap door. It looked like it had been sealed off, as even the round door handle had been glued to the hardwood. And I called my wife down so that she could look at it, and ask her what she thought what was in it. She replied with the most boring answer, saying that it had been sealed off because there was nothing of use in there anymore. And, well, we stopped talking about it instantly. A few weeks later, we completely moved in. Mel was already about halfway through her second term when we moved in. We started painting the walls, argued for the baby's room, and settled for neutral colors. Baby yellow and green. I kind of like the end result. She was pretty creative too. She drew little bunnies on the wall to add character to the room. While she busied herself making the baby's room pretty, I took care of sanding the hardwood floors. I wanted her not to paint or do anything, but Mel wore a mask and, well, she took a lot of breaks. She told me she was fine and that the babies would be fine too, and that I needed to just stop playing mother hen with her, and she would beat me up with her tiny hands. So I let her. It looked like it was making her happy, and, well, you know, who was I to deny her that joy? She was preparing the room for her babies. I couldn't stop thinking about that trap door in the basement, though. And quite honestly, the first night I couldn't sleep. I went to the kitchen to make myself a tea when I heard something similar to a breeze. Just a small whooshing of air coming from the basement. I thought it was weird because there were no windows down there. But I didn't do much. Halfway through my cup of tea, the wind started to carry a voice. I couldn't make out the word because they felt stretched, tired, and a bit like me since I spent the day sanding those damn floors. I blamed the fact that I was tired and went back to bed once I finished my tea. But it didn't stop there. Every night after that one, I woke up at two in the morning. Every night. I went down to make a cup of tea heard that whooshing noise and tried to ignore it till I finally understood what the wind was saying. Help me. After a week, I made my way down to the basement. Couldn't feel a breeze on my face, but still could hear that voice. It came from the trap. It kept calling for help. As I approached the trap, the words became clearer and much scarier. Help me. Help me. It kept chanting and I heard scratching behind the trap. Now, I'm not a big fan of horror movies, but I'm not going to be that big, dumb, blonde jock who's opening a trap in the basement. Even if I don't believe in the supernatural, I'm not risking it. But something was definitely scratching the wood under the trap. It didn't sound like a dog scratching to be let out. It was like the slow dragging of nails against the wood, slowly chipping at it. That, combined with the help me chant, made me feel pretty small in my boxers. I talked to my wife about it the next morning, and I could see in her eyes that she didn't believe me. She didn't laugh at me, but told me that maybe I needed not to go to the basement late at night and to lay off the tea. And so I did. For two days, I went straight to bed and forgot about the basement. The wind, the scratching, just everything. I blamed it on paint papers and sanding like crazy. Blamed my tiredness and my creative brain for what was making noise in the basement. But two days later, I was woken up to a loud banging noise coming from down there. Hell, even my wife woke up. And when we woke up, there was a horrid smell filling the room. Not unlike what you would smell when you enter a room that's been locked for too long and growing its own stuff on the wall. The humidity was thick, 
and there was a scratchy, clicking noise that sent chills down my spine. My wife grew up in a poor neighborhood, so she reached under the bed and pulled out a baseball bat from there, giving it to me. We both got out of the room in our pajamas and walked toward the stairs leading to the basement. The ocean came back, and now my wife had no choice to believe me. She clung to my arm as I turned on the light to the basement, only to hear the bulb explode in the distance. My hands were moist, and despite my tight grip on the bat, I wasn't ready to face whatever was making that call for help down there. I got one step down, and my wife's grip on my arm tightened. She called my name and said that we should call the police, but I wasn't sure what the police would be able to do. If there was indeed something under the trap door calling for help, in a house that's been for sale for two years. Well, I didn't want to continue that train of thought. The sound of chains rattling on the ground stopped me from going any further. We didn't have anything in the basement yet, and definitely not chains. Yeah, we weren't that kind of a couple. A distorted complaint soon joined the rattling of chains, and it felt like it was getting closer. There were a few thumps on the ground. It felt like wet towels hitting the floor. A small splashing sound and dragging. God, the dragging. Followed by more screams and moans and the voice I recognized to be the one calling for help. Something was walking toward us. Something wet that reeked of decay and had chains rattling on the ground. Walking is a big word. It sounded more like crawling or dragging. Something was crawling towards us, toward the stairs where I stood with my wife in the baseball bat. It was dark in the basement. I couldn't see a thing, even with the light on in the hallway. I could only see the first couple of feet down there, and the trap door was about ten feet away. How long can this thing crawl before I start seeing it? Well, it wasn't long, apparently. A hand came into the light, and I took a step back up with my wife. A greenish, discolored hand with bones showing through whatever was left of the skin. I heard the sound of someone retching, and the disgusting, splashing noise of liquid and bits hitting the ground, and I took another step back up. All of my instincts were screaming at me to leave, and yet, I was frozen on the spot. So was Mel. The whooshing was back, and another hand came into light, this one with even less skin covering half-eaten bones. Part of a face came into the light, and the thing retched again, but it wasn't vomit that was dripping from their lips. It was maggots and oil, thick black liquid and creepy white crawlers that squirmed as soon as they were out of their lips. Long strands of unkept, wet black hair framed the creature's face, making it appear even thinner than it probably was. The skin over its face was so thin, I could perfectly see the shape of its skull, where it was caved in, right above the eyebrow. The thing called for help again, and it stared right into my eyes with its soulless gaze. I was met with pure white eyes that looked like I had a translucent coating on it. Dead. I could feel death as I stared into the thing's eyes. And then, it just started screaming. The way its lips curled to reveal blackened gums and missing teeth was the last straw for us. I ran out of the house with my pregnant wife, screaming and yelling. We called the police from a payphone, gave her address, said the door was unlocked and probably still open. I can't remember if I bothered closing it. We told them about what we saw in the basement, or, well, what we thought we saw. When we returned to the house, several hours later, we were questioned by the police about what we saw. My wife was completely exhausted and still shocked. So I asked that she be questioned later as she was pregnant with twins and needed rest. We then drove to a nearby motel 
and the cops said that until they were done with their house, this is where we should stay. I answered all their questions twice, if not three times. Now it's been a month, and we still haven't been able to return to our house. I called the number they gave me because my wife was six months pregnant, but we couldn't afford to stay in a motel for too much longer. My call was redirected so many times that I just gave up. Eventually, after about one more week in the motel, the cops finally came to us. We couldn't get the house back. Something about the way the house was built, about the materials being toxic for humans, which caused us hallucinations and everything. At this point, though, my wife and I had already decided we were going to try to sell it, and I still asked why it took so long for the police to be involved. But the officer highly suggested I stop thinking about this. We were refunded entirely. Our loan was completely erased. <laughs> Believe it or not. We found another house a few weeks later, not too far from our parents' house. It was smaller, and it was a bit more expensive than the last one, but we liked it. And well, nobody had died in that one. This pasta is dedicated to Ray Williams and Jamie Russo. Congratulations on your newborn son, Jackson.